Just two possible wins left this season for Purdue, and if they get it, they will no longer be atop of this chart. Most tournament wins all time without having a national championship. It's the third all-time Final Four, and, and I want to get your big picture perspective on what it means for Painter, what it means for Purdue fans, historical. But let's start off by talking about that game. That was a wild, fascinating game. It was the worst three-point shooting performance the entire season for Purdue. It was the best offensive performance the entire career for Zach Eady. Connect couldn't miss a shot no matter who was guarding him. It was a bizarre back-and-forth wild game with runs on both sides. What was your biggest takeaway from it? Well, first of all, I witnessed the first version of this affair between Purdue and Tennessee in Honolulu back in November. Yep. And that was an absolute rock fight. Tons of fouls called. Uh, it was not the beautiful game, if you will, back in November. So I anticipated we we're going to see something similar to that. And Rick Barnes definitely made sure that this was going to be a very physical game. Dalton Connect just played at another level. Yeah. I mean, he's a lottery pick. You know, if Zach Eady, and he is, is number one for the player of the year, Connect is two. Uh, you know, no question. They're both All-Americans. Connect going from northern Colorado to Tennessee. He's an amazing story by himself. But I thought the resiliency showed itself again for Purdue because they got knocked back in the first few minutes. Oh, yeah. I mean, Tennessee came right at them. They couldn't miss. No. And, and Purdue had to calm down, not take too many ill-advised shots, make sure that Zach got his inside – Paint touches, reposting, all those things went for, for Purdue. And then, when it mattered most, they rose up the Lance Jones yeah. three, the block that you just referenced in that highlight, because he doesn't get enough recognition, I think, for his rim protection. A lot of shots are altered just by his presence rather than his shot blocking. Right. Um, but that was a case where he just said, I'm going to put myself out there. I'm going to block this shot at a critical moment. And then just his domination, 40 and 16. If there was ever any question <laughs> about his importance, his status, or what he has meant to the college basketball the last couple of years, he answered it. And he's got two more games potentially right. to just cement his status in this game. 22 free throw attempts. Painter ribbed him for missing eight of those attempts and said it would have been a 50-point performance if he just hit his free throws. I will say one thing that's kind of annoyed me, it's happened on the women's side too. There are people who are upset, <laughs> upset that fouls are being called when they should be called. Like, Zach Eady is tough to score on. He's huge, he's smart, he's incredibly well positioned. It leads to fouls. That doesn't mean the officials are biased. It was like when the Iowa women played West Virginia. West Virginia's style was to be physical, to be in your face. That leads leads to foul calls. Fouls are not supposed to be 15 on one side and 15 on another. It's whoever commits the foul gets them called. It's really annoying how much coverage there is on, wait a minute, this guy who's the best of the country at drawing fouls is drawing a lot of fouls. Well, yeah. I, I've seen, I've covered so many of their games over the last couple of years. I've literally seen the scratches right. on Zach Eady. You know, he gets kneed, uh, you know, back in the back of the knee, uh, low back, everywhere, because he's so strong. They cannot stop him. And if he gets the ball deep in the post, it's over if he has that kind of position. So what do they try to do? They try to be physical. When, when I was with them in Indianapolis, he was saying after the Grambling State game and the Utah State game, he says, look, everyone keeps trying to be physical with me, and it's not working. Mm -hmm. I mean, he has improved his stamina, his physicality. Uh, the fact that he played, what, 39 minutes, 38, 39 minutes? 39 and 27 yeah, seconds. Yeah, I mean, that's remarkable. Just go back three years, uh, it wasn't – you know, yeah, Travian Williams was an outstanding player, and he split time with him. But part of that reason was he couldn't play more than right. 20, 25 minutes. Yeah. So his endurance has increased dramatically, which, of course, has allowed Purdue to be even better. You know, one of the things that uh, the narratives about Purdue coming into this season was, well, how are they different? What have they learned from last year? Why, why should we believe this team won't again be upset early on in the NCAA tournament? And one of the things I would always say, and I know you said too, is the guards are just better. And part of that is Braden Smith took seven steps forward from his freshman to his sophomore year. Part of that is Lance Jones. And there was a great article in The Athletic talking about the switch defensively when Connect suddenly had Jones on him. All of a sudden, he wasn't hitting all of his three-pointers. In fact, once the switch happened and Jones was defending him, he went like two of eight from behind the three-point line. That little switch, the maneuver by Painter, the maturity and the skill set of Jones as an older guard coming into this program, that's a perfect example of what makes this Purdue team different. And I'm going to add one other thing to your point. Um, their role definition up and down the roster is phenomenal. In this me, 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 you know, era, 
that if I don't get mine, I'm out of here. Ethan Morton. He was highly recruited coming out of high school, and he's taken a back seat. Yep. Obviously, he's struggled a ton to score offensively in that Gonzaga game. He was on the floor to draw fouls. Two, boom, you're out. He played his role. Caleb first, obviously, at maybe last year, really, he had more of a run. He's taking a back seat. When he comes in, he does his job. You know, Cam Heidi has sort of emerged as sort of that, you know, right behind Mason Gillis as the next best player to come off the bench. He's got a lot of hype coming in. He's taking his role. Mason Gillis is a great example, too. Totally. He's accepted being the sixth man. He's the best sixth man uh, in the Big Ten. And, and, and Miles Colvin. I was just going to say, know, Colvin could player. be doubling his minutes in another program. But he's yeah. smart. He knows it's good for the team. And, and I don't know. Maybe these guys will bolt after you know, next weekend. Uh, but they haven't yet. Right. Trey Kaufman rent. He is waiting his turn and playing the complimentary role. So... Something's in the water in West Lafayette because right. clearly they're all in there. They're, you know, for the common goal. So many other programs that is not happening where guys are taking their role for trying, you know, trying to win a championship and accepting that this particular season, this game, it's not going to be about me. Impressive stuff for a team that, again, didn't even play its best game, not even close, but they move on to the Final Four for the first time since 1980, and this is what the Final Four looks like. UConn-Bama up top, NC State-Purdue down at the bottom. The Boilermakers will play the early game Saturday, just after 6 Eastern time, 5 Central time. But first things first, Purdue had to go home, and they came home to hundreds and hundreds of fans waiting for them. They're riding that Boilermaker Express, holding up their Final Four trophy. What an awesome time to be a Purdue fan. What an awesome time for those players. It's been the, the cloud over the program for so long, the fact that they've had that historic loss as a 1 to a 16 last year. They had to deal with it. They stayed in it. Painter gets through it. Those fans get through it. These players get through it. Big picture, what was it like for you to realize that Matt Painter and all those players finally conquered that? I know there's still two games, but getting to the Final Four is a massive deal for that program. Look, we're all human, and there are relationships, and I I'm just thrilled for them because what they went through a year ago, I mean, look, it's not life or death, but, I mean, in the sport, it was pretty bad, yeah. you know, to be the second team ever to lose – to a 16, but it was also the cumulative effect because the year before they lost to St. Peter's when they shouldn't have in the Sweet 16. They had a right. week to prepare for that game. Go back the year before losing to another double digit, double -digit seed. seeds. You know, so it's happened year after year where they've not met the expectation. And then I'm going to go back to 2019 because 2019 they were the best team. Yeah. Carson Edwards was on a historic run, and it's Virginia, sort of <laughs> symmetry here that has an unbelievable finish to get that game into overtime and beat them in overtime. I was at that game in Louisville, and that was just jaw-dropping. But now here they have a chance to do what Virginia did. And actually, a couple of weeks ago, I spoke with Kyle Guy, you know, part of that 1819, and he told me he texted a lot. Of, he's from Indiana, mm -hmm. so he knows a lot of these uh, Purdue guys. He texted them last year, said, here's what we went through, and referenced, you know, how they got through it. And I just, I love that they embraced... And maybe that's the wrong word, but I really do think they embraced the loss last year. Right. They did not shy away from it. Matt Painter, Zach Eady, all the guys, they came back. They didn't bail. You know, these players that could have bailed, they did not. They worked at it. They played a brutal non-conference schedule. They challenged themselves. They win the Big Ten regular season by multiple games. Um, you know, they did lose in overtime to Wisconsin in the semis. Might have been the best thing for them. Yes. They didn't need that tournament. They could have used rest with Braden Smith's leg injury. So, no, it worked out for them. And here they are with a chance to do something that Virginia did in 1819 yeah. uh, and, and really in position to make some history for the university. And I will add that, you know, we saw that them coming back. I thought it was so great what Zach Eady did yesterday where he offered a piece of the net yeah. to Gene Cady. Gene Cady really obviously is the architect of what we see in modern-day Purdue basketball. You know, one of the great coaches who's a you know, Hall of Famer who didn't get to the Final Four. It shouldn't define you, but, of course, people right. do define you by it. Right. And so he's been brought, you know, he's part of the program. He was Matt Painter's coach. 
And, and that was just a great moment to see him sharing all this. It is amazing. Matt Painter has built this incredible legacy on the back of Gene Cady, who built this incredible legacy. The last time Purdue was in a Final Four, Cady hadn't been hired. He's in Western Kentucky. As the head coach yet at Purdue. That's how long it's been. But I will say, you said something that I know in the back of a Boilermaker diehard fan is starting to become an ember into a flame, which is double-digit seeds have taken them down. And who do they have on Saturday a double-digit seed in NC State. Yeah, I mean, it's crazy. I mean, they are on an unbelievable Cinderella run. I mean, when they won the title in 83, similar situation. Not expected to be there. They lost four games before the <laughs> ACC tournament. In a row. They played on Tuesday at the ACC tournament. <laughs> it had never happened. Five wins in five days. They do that. In fact, in the semi, it's a Michael Connell banked in three to tie that Virginia game. Force overtime. And Virginia had missed a free throw. They make that free throw. It's a four-point game. It's over. Yeah. They don't make the tournament. Head coach may be fired. Oh, yeah. I mean, hidden clause in Kevin Keats' contract that if he wins the ACC tournament, he gets two years extension. So, <laughs> great negotiating there because I don't think they ever thought that was going to happen. And then along the way, they beat Texas Tech. And then in the second round, nothing against Oakland, but that was supposed to be Kentucky. Right. Kentucky loses to Oakland. So, they get Oakland, beat them. And then Sweet 16... I mean, Marquette, who I'd seen in Indy, played one of its worst games. They beat Marquette. Yeah. And then they take down their arch rival Duke in the Elite Eight, which Amazing. obviously was great for NC State. And so here they are. The Burns ED matchup's going to be great. Horn versus, you know, Smith. Uh, O'Connell's obviously a good shooter. Uh, I just don't think they have the depth. Um, the main thing for Purdue will be don't get tight. Right. Because Don't get swallowed by the moment because, as we've seen, the underdog, the crowd gets going for them. You know, UConn fans will be rooting for NC State. Sure. You know, and so will Alabama fans, I'm sure. So don't get swallowed up by the moment. They have more losses than any Final Four team ever. And yet, they've gone 9-0 and in the last 20 days to get to this point where they are playing Purdue. We'll have more on that matchup in the Final Four coming up just a little bit later on in the show. We're also going to have more basketball with Andy on the men's side as he was covering the Illini and their loss in the Elite Eight. What does he make of that bizarre 30 to nothing run? And up next, Iowa plays in the Elite Eight tonight with a chance to make it back-to-back -back Final Fours. We preview LSU and the Hawkeyes next. Time for our big stat fueled by Gatorade, and it looks at the NCAA Women's Tournament. The amount of victories in the last two years, LSU has nine, Iowa has eight. Guess what? Those two meet up. The last time they played was exactly 365 days ago in the national championship game in LSU 1. As for tonight's matchup, let's check in with Kylan Mills. Thanks, Mike. I'm joined now by Maryland Hall of Famer Christy Winter Scott. Great to have you here to talk more about top seeded Iowa taking on third seeded LSU. Now, this is a rematch of the 2023 national title game, which the Tigers won by 17. However, a lot different personnel on both sides this time around. What are some of the differences and similarities you're expecting in this matchup? Well, the differences, let's start there. Let's start with personnel for both teams. They're very different. You heard Kate Martin talk about that in their press conference. She said they're different, but so are we. When you're looking at Iowa, they're missing two of their key cog starters, but they're bringing 11 players back with experience of going all the way to the final game of the year last year. So when you're looking at what LSU did last year and how they're different, they had players coming off the bench who were averaging seven points, Alexis Morris, and knocking in threes and coming up big with 21, 22 points. So they had impact players that were outside of the star role. So when you're looking at what Angel Reese did, she had 15 points, but she was in foul trouble in that first mm -hmm. half last year in the championship game. And then for Caitlin Clark, she had big numbers. She had 30 points, but she was just 9 of 22 from the floor. So it was tough for her to get those 30, but we're talking about Caitlin Clark right now. So that's what's going to be a little bit different. I think defensively, you're going to see maybe some changes on the Iowa side, but on the rebounding side, I mean, LSU leads the country in board. So I think that stayed the same. To dig more into that rebounding battle, not necessarily one of the strengths of this Iowa team and this LSU team averages more than 16 offensive boards per game. 
In order for Iowa to get out and run like they want to do, they have to be able to grab those rebounds. How do they disrupt the Tigers on the glass? Well, what Iowa likes to do defensively, they like to mix it up. So they're going to stay player to player sometimes. That's what Lisa Bluter calls their man-to-man -man defense. Yeah. But sometimes they'll go with a triangle and two, and everyone knows that, right? They like to pack the line, but they also like to run some two-three zone. They mixed it up last year against LSU as well. But everyone, I don't think that it's true when people say you can't rebound out of a zone. You've got to check your left and right and find a body and maintain that contact. And I know it's easier said than done. Trust me, I was down in there trying to box out in the Final Four way back in the day. But when you're talking about what LSU can do on the glass, they love to maximize their offensive rebounding opportunities. Top five in the country with those 16 O boards per game. So, yes, they've got to get the stops. It doesn't necessarily always have to be on the glass. But for Iowa, they've got to get into those gaps. They've got to take away those driving spaces, especially for Johnson. She was so tough in their last game with those 24 points, but she did it in attack mode against UCLA, got downhill and finished in the paint. So they got to take the paint away, number one. But then they also have to disallow the second chance opportunities for LSU. On the positive side, Iowa's offense much more balanced in their win over Colorado. Five players averaging in double figures after just four players scored in their win over West Virginia in the second round. Who needs to step up in this matchup against LSU for this Iowa offense to be successful outside of Caitlin Clark? Well, it's got to be Sydney Falter. I think she has just been absolutely spectacular in her role. She has starred in that role, especially in the absence of Molly Davis with that knee injury. We thought we may see Molly Davis in the postseason. Haven't seen her yet, which is just fine. But I think Sydney Falter has just been ready to go. And I think when you've seen the steadiness and the consistency with what she's been able to do, not just on the offensive end where she has been magnificent, but on the defensive end and on the glass. They're going to need every bit of what Sydney Falter brings to the table. And then Kate Martin's the glue. We understand that as well. And then Gabby Marshall, she has just been fantastic too from range. And they've needed all of that. But everyone is going to have to step up and be on their A game if they want to punch a ticket to the Final Four yet again. A falter, by the way, shooting 58% from the floor, 58% from three, has only missed one free throw since one. Molly Davis's injury. Just goes yeah. to show how ready she was to step into that starting role. Once again, Iowa taking on LSU in what is going to be a huge Monday night matchup. Unfortunately, though, this weekend, the road came to an end for Indiana. The Hoosiers fell to the top overall seed, South Carolina, 79-75 in the Sweet 16. The loss also marked a bittersweet goodbye for one of the program's all-time greats in Ford, Mackenzie Holmes. So bittersweet. Saying goodbye yeah. to Ford, Mackenzie Holmes, the program's all-time leading yeah. scorer, just embodies the heart that the Hoosiers represent. In your eyes, what is the mm -hmm. legacy that Mackenzie Holmes leaves behind? A workhorse. I mean, that's exactly what Mackenzie Holmes brought to the table day in and day out, game in and game out. You knew what you were getting with Mackenzie Holmes and Terry Moore, and we'll say as much. When you have a player who comes in as a freshman and is asked to do big things and steps into that role and not only steps into it, embraces it. And then as her career evolved, you saw her dominate in that role, becoming an All-American and the all-time leading scorer for Indiana. That's major time. And the tears in her eyes, I just got chills, mm. but the tears in her eyes show what it means to her. And all of what she did during her tenure, five years, not a lot of players come back and stay for their fifth year. She came back. She wanted to run it back. She hadn't been healthy in the postseason. But it's just really great to see that kind of humility, number one, but that kind of emotion. Because a lot of times when you're looking at the transfer portal was what she was talking about. Mm -hmm. With the transfer portal, everything has kind of become transactional instead of emotional. And for her to see that emotion, that just means a lot to me. And you have to tip your hat and respect her for everything that she's done and given to the program and the conference and women's basketball. You also have to tip your cat, too, to the way this Hoosiers team performed in their last game of the season, the Sweet 16. They yeah. fell to the top overall seed in South Carolina by four points. The Hoosiers trailed by as much as 22 in that game, they battled back. They never gave up. They made it a two-point ball game with yeah. under a minute to go. It came down to just those final couple possessions. Mm -hmm. What did you see from the fight that this team showed? Well, just what we've seen all along. All season long, we've seen their best, right? In the absence of Grace Berger, the All-American, playing in the WNBA for the Indiana Fever now. But everyone stepped into a different kind of role. We saw shots falling for Sarah Scalia. We saw everything going right for Chloe Moore McNeil in terms of the defensive prowess that she brought to the table every time. I wouldn't want to put the ball down in her area 
ever. And then Sydney Parrish, wow, she was draining mm. those triples and just kept Indiana right in that game. But it was just so tough against a team like South Carolina that comes at you in waves and waves. They just couldn't stop that last wave. And Terry Moran even said, if we had about five more minutes, things could have been a little bit different because they had gained that much momentum down the stretch but just ran out of time. Something Holmes touched on is how much head coach Terry Moran means to her, the players on this team, and the job that she has done. Ten seasons now at the helm, six NCAA tournament bursts, the program's all-time winningest coach. What has she been able to enact on this Indiana program? Outside of all the tactical things, which have been yeah. outstanding, let's talk about the relationships that she's built. And you saw it in the eyes of Mackenzie Holmes there. I mean, there has been a sisterhood that has been built during Terry Moore's time at Indiana. And you have to respect that as well. And, and that's what Big Ten basketball is all about. I don't care if it's men's basketball, women's basketball, any of the other sports. This is what they're going to remember for the rest of their lives. I was just telling you about things that happened years ago yeah. because it's March and the memories stay with you. And that's the thing with Terry Moore. And I mean, she's taught them more than basketball and X's and O's and pick and rolls. She's taught them about sisterhood and giving the good for the great when it comes to being selfless as a team player. And I think that's what we've seen with Indiana during Terry Moran's time. And that stuff you can't encapsulate and you can't minimize it. I think it's going to last for a lifetime for these young women as leaders in whatever they do next. Well, Indiana with a really successful season, their third Sweet 16 in five years. Unfortunately, it comes to a close, but once again, hats off to Mackenzie Holmes yeah. on an incredible career. Well, Christy, we'll be back later tonight to break down more women's hoops on the big show. And if you're lucky, you'll also give everyone a lesson in how to box out, which Getting I just drawn. got. Yeah, uh-oh, we're throwing some <laughs> bows over arms. here. We're throwing some bows <laughs> over here. We'll send it Shut back it to up. you, Mike. <laughs> Thank you, Kylan. I've been boxed out by those elbows before. It hurts. Here's a look at the women's tournament. Two teams already in the final four, the amazing undefeated South Carolina squad against NC State. And then you see it is possible there could be a future Big Ten matchup with Iowa taking on USC in the other Final Four game. Speaking of Final Fours, we got another one. It's in hockey, the Frozen Four. Michigan took down a Michigan State team that had beaten them four times in a row this season. How did it happen? Kathy's here to explain that. So the Maize and Blue are trying to win the Big Ten, their first national championship since 2007 when Michigan State, the team they just took down, yeah. did it. Paul Kaepernigri joining me yep. here. What a way to do it against your rival that had won the Big Ten that had dominated you the last four games. Yeah. That's a storybook for Michigan. Yeah, I mean, and it's tough for Michigan State because you look at that, you're like, it's, it's just hard to beat a team five times in a row, let alone your rival, like you said, and let alone a top ten really good team. So, you know, tough for Michigan State, but Michigan, they've just – answered the bell all the time. They lost Seamus Casey, did not, an All-American defenseman, did not play in this game. Um, this will be their third straight Frozen Four. Nobody else of the three teams going will be have done that. Um, and it, I, I saw a tweet about this about a month ago when they lost to Minnesota. They were 16th in the pairwise, hmm. which means if they didn't win the Big Ten, they would have been out. And, and they would like not have made the, the tournament. beginning of March, if I'm not mistaken. The last weekend of the regular right. season. So they had to beat Notre Dame in the playoffs. They swept them. They beat Minnesota. That put them, that got them up into the tournament in terms of at large. And then obviously losing to Michigan State didn't. But it's funny how one month can change things. I just think they found their game. Uh, you know, last week they lost the Big Ten tournament in overtime right. to at, at Munn. Uh, so they, they didn't point. play a bad game. It was a good game. Could have went either way. Um, so Michigan did everything yesterday. They got their skill guys to make great plays. You yep. saw that. And then you lose Seamus Casey. Marshall Warren scored defenseman. Ethan Edwards had a goal and two assists defenseman. So guys stepped up. That You're always looking for that in the, in the, in the tournament, right? right. Who's going to step up? Dylan Duke's got a couple has goals. Been phenomenal. But to step up for Seamus Casey offensively because he's their best defenseman. Off he kind of runs their offense. Weird to say that a defenseman does that. But him being out, those other guys really stepped up for Michigan. And that's, what you, that's where successful teams end up in the tournament when that happens. And the third period had two goals in a 12-second span. Including the Nazar one. And I know you're a Blackhawks fan, sure. so you saw that. Happy to see. Uh, nice first-round pick of the Chicago Blackhawks. And Gavin Brindley scores a goal. So the big boys stepped up at the right time. Again, it's a Michigan team with the top six players in terms of points in the Big Ten all on oh, their yeah. roster. And we should take a second to talk about Brandon Narado. Remember, last year... 
He's See if the, he's okay from that bath he took. <laughs> right, yeah. i am just got pneumonia now. He, he's the interim head coach to start yeah. the season. A bad way for the season to start. He gets them all the way to the Frozen Four. They have no choice but to make him the full-time head coach. <laughs> he's back there again two years in charge of the program, two Frozen Fours. Yeah, it's pretty remarkable what he's done. Young coach, I think he just relates to the young guys. You know, you're seeing that a lot in college sports right now. Um, but he gets it. Um, you know, I've talked to him about it, talked to one of his assistant coaches I played with in junior hockey, Matt Deschamps. Um, they're just, you, it's all about relationships, I think, at this point. Getting put, Pushing the right buttons mm-hmm. at the right times with the players. you got 20 guys on the ice, all wanting all the ice time. you got to spread it out. And then when a guy goes out like Seamus Casey again, someone's got to fill that void. Right. And if you have the guys in the right mentality – I think that just works, and I think Brandon Murado just touch, hits the right buttons at the right time. Yeah, it certainly has been a great hire for the Maze in Blue. They're off to the Frozen Four, so the bracket right now looks like this. Tough one coming up. BC, <laughs> your favorite. They are the number one overall seed in this. If they will win, they'll take on either Denver or Boston University. Your initial thoughts when you see this and you see what Michigan has to do to advance? I mean, it's going to be a track meet. I think the offense is going to be they're two of the top offenses in the country. Um, Michigan's the number one power play in the country. Boston College is at two or three. Um, it's just going to be interesting. Marshall Warren, the guy I spoke about, is, was a four-year guy at BC, transfers to Michigan, so he's going to be a little amped up. Um, BC had six guys on the World Junior Gold Medal team. Michigan had four, so a lot of guys that have played together on the USA programs and the national teams are going to be playing against each other. Um, you know, it, it's, it's just going to be – BC has just been the best team all year. But you know what? Michigan is playing their best hockey right now, and I think it's a good matchup. I think it's going to go run and gun. It's going to come down to what the old cliche in hockey, goaltending. Yeah. Um, and Jake Barchespi has been great. Fowler for BC is phenomenal. So um, we've got about – 10 days to dissect. April and, um, 11th. Yep. I'll just keep doing that for the next yeah. 10 days. Michigan will be looking for their first national championship this century. 1998 yeah. was the last time they won one. And because they have moved on, that means Michigan State yeah. is done with their season as well. Uh, Minnesota and Wisconsin. Let me start with the Spartans. Yep. This is an undeniably successful season for MSU. Yeah, I mean, if, when you think about it, there's only going to be one team that's going to be completely happy at right. the end of the year. But I think the... The stepping stones that Adam Nightingale's done this year, I talked about it last week on the show, uh, to win the Big Ten in the regular season, to win the Big Ten uh, playoffs, things that have not been done at Michigan State. Um, He's just – and he's set up for the long haul. I think that's the important. And we're going to talk about other teams in the league too. But this is a program. This isn't like a, you know, a a flash in the pan type of situation. He's building for the future. Um, Yeah, unfortunate they couldn't couldn't win. I I hated the matchup that they had to get – grouped in the same bracket, but, you know, that's the way the NC. When you get too many Big Ten teams in, there's only 16 teams in it. Yeah. It's going to happen once in a while. Um, so, unfortunately, that way, but a great season for Michigan State. You were at the regional Minnesota yeah. was at. Their season comes to a close. They beat Omaha, then lose to BU. How do you look yeah. back on this year for the Gophers? Man, it's, it's interesting. I, I, a little what if, you know, if they could have been a little more consistent, but they're, they had a lot of youth, and they lost a ton of talent. They have five guys playing in the NHL right now. That's just really hard to overcome. Um, they have some really nice players. They had a great game. They had a 2 nothing lead late in the first period. Justin Close gave up a goal that everybody was like, I, he would take that back in a second. But he had a great career, um, and they just weren't able to get over the hump. BU's going to be fantastic. They're the number two team in the country for a reason. Uh, but Minnesota, um, I think this is a year that's going to be looked at good for next year because they have a ton of guys that will most likely be coming back. Yeah. And obviously, we bring in some more young talent. Right. Um, but this should be a good stepping stone for them for next year. How about Wisconsin? They lose in overtime to the defending yeah. national champs. Yeah, I mean, again, everyone's disappointed when they don't make it to the end. But when you look at what Mike Hasting has done in such in one year. I mean, he did even more than what Adam Nightingale was able to do in his first year. Mm-hmm. Um, I think another team, just like Michigan State, that they're building for the future. Yes, they wanted to go on. They wanted to win the Frozen Four. Uh, but they had a six, they, they were one game away from winning the Big Ten regular season. Um, and Mike Hastings is the key there. He's going to be able to recruit really well and bring in the right type of guys. He's going to build a culture 
Everyone talks about culture, but he's a guy that's done that. I played for him in the past. He's phenomenal doing that. He gets guys to buy in, and the future is bright at Wisconsin. Just a tough overtime loss, too. I mean, that's just devastating. Right. Yeah, and at least they were back in the tournament after missing it for the last yeah, few years. Yeah, exactly. Years. Paul Capinigri, like you said, 10 days and the Frozen I can count down. Watch some basketball in between. You're allowed. Okay. You're allowed to switch sports <laughs> for sure. Well, the season came to a close for the Illinois men's basketball program and in one of the more bizarre ways ever. They were tied at 23, approaching halftime, and then they literally couldn't, store, couldn't score and practically couldn't stop UConn. 30 unanswered points for the Huskies, and before you know it, the game was over. Same thing for the Illini season. Back here with Andy Katz. I mean, that was bizarre. This is an excellent Illinois team and they couldn't do anything. They kept attacking the big guy Klingon, and it kept not working. Terrence Shannon, who's been out of his mind incredible most of the season, but especially the month of March, couldn't get a bucket. What happened at the end? Well, I mean, first of all, as you said, they withstood the first punch. Yeah. They were down, I think, 9 nothing. Pretty quick. Um, climb back, 23 all, and actually Klingon came out of the game for a little bit. They get it there. And then a little quick burst by UConn at the end of the half. To make it 28-23. I was doing sideline. I, I met with Brad Underwood in the back uh, hallway. Uh, and he said, hey, I'm feeling, you know, like we're in a good spot. I mean, that's what he said, you know. We're only down five. We weathered the storm. He said to me in the hallway, we got we to gotta shoot threes. We're, we're not taking threes. Yeah. We're basically looking them off. And he said we're going to keep going to Klingon. That didn't work out. Yeah. Uh, Klingon had the game of, you know, I wouldn't say the game of his life, but he played a tremendous game. He was so fired up. And then, yeah, it's everything that went wrong or could go wrong went wrong because they didn't want to give him runouts. They didn't rebound well. It was one shot and, and, and they were done. They weren't taking those threes. And when they finally did, it felt like they were rushed, even though they weren't guarded as well and they were short. Uh, and then it's a steamroll. I mean, I can't remember ever seeing something like that. Yeah. Certainly not at that stage in the NCAA tournament against a team that was one of the top two offenses in the country. Right. That it was 30 to nothing. And then I went and listened to their huddle late in the second half, and, and it became a pride thing. You know, let's just stop the bleeding. Let's get it within 20 or something. Let's just stop. You know, yeah. let's fight. Let's finish this. Uh, it's really unex it's, it's hard to explain how it completely went away from them. They missed 22 out of 30 shots at the rim in this game. That's how unbelievable Klingon was at owning that space. They couldn't get anything done. And it's weird, too. They were a good three-point shooting team. They loved the three. They couldn't get them to fall. It reminds you of the game before when they beat Iowa State. They couldn't hit a free throw. Right. They missed half of their free throws just about. They still got that win to get into the Elite Eight, but... A bummer way for their season to come to a close. It was a great season for Illinois. You recap what the year was. They were the second place team in the Big Ten in the regular season. They won the Big Ten Tournament Championship. They make it to the Elite Eight for the first time since 2005. Again, it's a bummer for them to, to end the season the way it did in such disappointing fashion, but 20, they almost had 30 wins. They haven't done that since that magical 05 run. Well, and we have to acknowledge, and Brad Underwood told us this many times, I mean, they had three seasons. I mean, they had the season at the beginning uh, where they didn't play their best basketball. Remember, they lost at home to Marquette. They were starting to get going. And then Terrence Shannon was suspended, and he missed six games. And then during that time, Marcus Damask really excelled, and they put themselves in position to be one of those top two teams. And then when Shannon came back, that game against Northwestern, they absolutely blitzed them uh, in you know that first game. Um, actually, I'm sorry. It was the first game without him mm -hmm. in the Big Ten in January. Uh, where they beat Northwestern. Um, so they had six games without him. And then he returned. You know, they played that great game against Northwestern the second time around. Um, and they ended up mounting this campaign. And to me, their season, really, you could put a bow on when they won at Iowa to end the regular season. That last game on the last Sunday, that sent notice that, hey, we're going to make a deep run. They win at Iowa. They go through the Big Ten tournament to win that championship. And pre remember, the previous two years, the Big Ten tournament champ lost in the first round. Did not go very far, right. Iowa two years ago to Richmond. Last year, as we know, Purdue to FDU. They had a shaky first half against Moorhead State, and then they flipped the switch, and they were great 
up until UConn. Right. Well, they will be losing guys off this team next year, but if you ask Brad Underwood, he'll absolutely tell you this program is in a really good spot right now. Where do you see this program going in the coming year or two? I agree with Brad. Nowhere. Um, the reality, <laughs> in a good way. <laughs> yes. The reality is, and I don't know if the other three coaches were telling the truth uh, in Boston, um, Brad said that he was making portal calls before practice. And I wouldn't, I don't think there's anything wrong with that. His mind was locked in. This, was before, this was before the Iowa State game, right. not before UConn. And all four, the other three coaches, Dutcher, Hurley, and, and Otzelberger, said, no, 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 not now. Now I'm sure their assistants were. Right. Um, but that's the reality. The portal opened on March 18th. And it's, I, I think it's ridiculous, but it is what it is, and you got to act. And I fully expect Illinois to be an active participant in it. They obviously added multiple players, whether it was Damask, Harmon, um, you know, Guerriere, uh, a couple of years ago, Danger. So they've built their program with a couple of high school guys. Um, well, obviously, Shannon was a transfer, too. Texas Tech. Um, yeah, so, and, and then, you know, a guy like Hawkins, who was there at the beginning. So they've, they've, they've complimented whether it's guys they recruited early or transfers, and they've built an elite program. And I, I doubt many people outside of Champaign know, in the last five years, no Big Ten team has more wins than Illinois. Think about that. Yeah, I know. And they challenged themselves in the non-conference. Yep. Um, remember a couple of years ago they played Arizona. Uh, so they're looking to do the same. I have no doubt in my mind Illinois is going to be competing for a Big Ten title next year. Where, where they you know, figure in the standings, we shall see. Yeah, sure feels like it. Again, another good season for Illinois. They had five NCAA tournament wins from 2006 to last year, and they had three NCAA tournament wins in just the last two weeks. Final thoughts from Andy as we get ready for the final four. NC State, Alabama, UConn, and Purdue. Where do the Boilermakers fit in and all of that? We'll find out after this. And then there were four. UConn, NC State, Purdue, and Alabama on Saturday. They will be meeting up in the final four in Phoenix. You will be there. Your, your buddy Larry David might be with you. I'm not sure. You hung out with him at the Elite Eight. Yeah, he didn't you'll... like the uh, Illinois strategy, by the way. Of going on against Klingon? No. Yeah. He expressed that to me at halftime. Well, let's give him a whistle. Clipboard. I did tell him I'm a great middler. A little side brother. <laughs> you would agree with that. I think so. Yeah. I think so. You drive the conversation. Uh, what do you think is the biggest storyline of this Final Four? To me, it feels like the beginning of the year, most people thought Purdue and UConn were the two best teams. The beginning of the tournament, most people thought Purdue and UConn were the two best teams. And now we're, what, 80 minutes away from Purdue and UConn meeting up for the national title yeah I hate to sort of squash the Cinderella story but I'm sorry like you know NC State Alabama fans although it's hard to look at Alabama as a Cinderella uh, right. but in basketball they've never been there I don't think anyone outside of those two fan bases wants to see it you want to see the two Goliaths here UConn and Purdue as you said two best teams throughout the course of the season two most consistent teams two most dominant number ones uh, they've got great big men, and you've got UConn trying to win back-to-back -back championships for the first time since 06, 07. Prior to that, it was Duke in 91 and 92. They've been dominant. Um, I, I just don't see any other team that can give them a game. Right. You know, Purdue can. I just don't see how Alabama made 16 threes to get to the Final Four against Clemson. They're going to have to make that number for sure against UConn and not make any turn turnovers or commit – um, any sort of unforced errors. NC State, yes, they can match up with Purdue, no question about it. Burns versus Edie, that could be an interesting matchup. Everyone wants to see that. They have the guard play, but they don't have the depth. We talked about this at the beginning of the show. I love Purdue's depth. I love their role definition. Um, you do kind of wait, when is this Cinderella run going to end? I mean, as you stated, they've got the worst record ever of a Final Four team. They weren't a very good basketball team. Right. Up until the ACC tournament. Three weeks ago. Yeah, so, and Purdue has been locked in. I mean, absolutely locked in. They know their purpose is to get to the final. And I will say this. If we get UConn-Purdue, it'll be the first game. I don't know if you agree with me on this. First game all season where I think the pressure's off Purdue. Oh, yeah, the defending champs would have to. I agree. The, the, the pressure's off now. You get to that final four to well, me. But I still think the pressure's on them to beat NC State to get there. 
I get your point. Yes. I, I think in the big picture, making the Final Four takes a monkey off yes. your shoulder. But I hear what you're saying. You don't want to lose to a double digit season yes. again. But if they go against UConn, I think all the pressure's on UConn. Yeah. All of it. Y you know who I, I'm happy for for the next five days until the tournament? Gene Cady, Robbie Hummel, yes. Etwan Moore, Jawan Johnson, Carson Edwards, big dog Glenn Robinson, Caleb Swanigan, the Purdue guys who helped build that program in the last four decades. Pretty cool time for them.